Hey, folks, thanks for joining us. Let's give it just a few more seconds for some people to hop on and we will jump right into it. Awesome. Looks like we've got a great crowd with us here today. So I want to thank you all for joining our webinar today. This is building the infrastructure of a successful BIM department. We are so grateful to have with us today, Alex, Hannah, and David Connolly from our Evolve partner, BIM Technology Management. And just as a reminder, this webinar is being recorded and we'll forward the recording to all registrants. You can also find all of our webinar recordings on the Evolve YouTube channel. If you have any questions, please submit them uh, using the Zoom Q&A function, and we'll um, have time at the end to take a few questions. We are also going to be running some polls during the webinar, so make sure to participate and get to see the answers from your BIM peers. Cool. So with that, I'm going to hand it over to Alex. Awesome. Thanks, Marina. Um, welcome, everybody. Uh, this webinar today, again, is about building the infrastructure of a successful BIM department. Um, and uh, it's one of the passions of mine, and I think David's as well. I've, I've been through the process of trying to build a successful BIM department. It takes a lot of moving parts, but there are some key foundation stuff we're going to go over today. So if you're new here, just a little introduction. Like Marina said, uh, BIM, TM, and Evolve have partnered up to give you the highest quality of training and education that we could provide in the BIM industry. Um, that being said, my name is Alex Hanna. I'm the director of BIM services out here in the uh, west side of the U.S. Um, and here's this is David. Go ahead, David. Uh, so I'm David Connolly. Uh, I'm a just a BIM specialist over here. I handle a lot of just technical stuff, and then uh, my background is more subcontractor and and uh, actual field experience mixed in with a little bit of uh, you know BIM experience as well. But that's it. So we'll go ahead and get started with the first slide, which is a big one. And I, <laughs> I know Alex, he, he you know, I, I didn't know he did module building. I actually knew him from somewhere else before this. And, and uh, the uh, the standard operating procedures is one that he probably is very versed on because of uh, yeah. uh, <laughs> so, his modular background. But it's uh, standard operating procedures and, and just file structures, locations. Hiring processes, documentation processes, and project setup and internal. Uh, this one was one that he actually. Uh, yes. Yeah, so <laughs> not me. the SOPs is a foundation. Whenever you're going through and you're starting. Um, uh, let me actually go to that. Help if the slide was going through, huh? Mm -hmm. So part of what that is, is, you know, what does the process look like when you go to save it uh project or a family or document where is that document saved how do you save that document what is the naming convention of that document do you have that written down so that when the new hire comes in that person knows how to save that document and the naming convention uh, we've all been in the spot where we start a new job and it's like okay i gotta figure out how we do things here and more often than not right there's someone coaching you through that first couple of days kind of like a shadowing <laughs> um i do remember when it comes back to the handbook, I remember when starting off in a company, we had the big thick drafting book of this is how we draft an AutoCAD and this is how we do it. And you sign it. Um, and you don't really see that a lot today within, you know, Revit or any other kind of 3D software. Uh, talk about SketchUp, right? There's companies that don't have those handbooks anymore. Um, and I think that's something that was very important to me when I was setting that up um, is what is the handbook? And when my new hire comes in, can they read this and know how we do things? Well, uh, so that I want to be, be clear with it too, that you're saying an internal, this is like a, a processes and procedures of the company itself, not like a, just a Revit handbook of how to do right. things. This is, right. this is your, your company standards all the way filled out, which right. I think is, is huge. You know, it's, it's massive. It's not and something I ever saw. Yeah. And then <laughs> having like your, your ops for project setup and like detailing that out. Uh, I think about how many times that's when you when you hire a new person and you got to tell them like, okay, this is how we set up a project. Okay, do your thing. Okay, this is how we save a project. This is, now, if you had that in front of them as a reference, it's a totally different thing. But standard foundations for just a successful BIM department is having good SOPs and putting them in place and implementing. I would say the next thing is definitely um, your internal training. So standard SOPs kind of go right into internal training. 
So you have your, your operating procedures that you use. That's kind of like your training for the new, new person. But let's say you hire a field guy, right? How do you share that knowledge and internal training from what the field guy has to the new person that you just hired and just came out of college and knows how to work in Revit, right? You're, you're a failure. No. <laughs> um, yeah, another one's like you have specialists and you have well-rounded people, right? How do you communicate the knowledge between the two? I know in, and I had an instance where I had specialists in the room and my well-rounded people knew who to ask the specialist for the knowledge they had. Um, oh, and there's a poll that just came up. If you guys haven't seen this, is what's your currently set of SOPs? Uh, if you have one, have you implemented it? Uh, please provide a go ahead and vote if you can. <laughs> um, but yeah, internal training, sharing knowledge. And then as that knowledge grows within your department, right, you're constantly learning. Right. Yeah. I mean, and that's the thing, especially like I think the biggest one is what you just said was was how to pass that trade knowledge down. Because that's mm-hmm. not, you know, you get someone in, you teach them how to click buttons and rev it and then you know, throw them on a project. And of course they'll draw something, you know, <laughs> I used to have a guy I worked with, he used to, he'd post, he'd put pictures up on it and he always just put art by as one <laughs> of his little, uh, uh comments. <laughs> Cause you just see this crazy stuff that doesn't meet code. It's wasteful, you know, um, I'm going to go ahead to the next one. Yeah. We actually got some results from our SOPs. It's good to know that there are some SOPs in there and, and you're already implementing for those that do not, it's very recommended that you start having some of those or even writing down your process, your day to day. And as you go through that, right, what does that look like? Right. No, it's definitely important. And it's just, again, it kind of feeds into this, right? <laughs> your right. quality assurance. Right. So, you know, that's your SOPs, your your checklists, your sign-off procedures, you know, keeping people accountable. That, that's something that they don't do. And we don't really do that in this industry a lot. You know, I can't remember how many times I used to, uh, bring a drawing to get checked and, and, you know, want to put my name on there. Cause I don't want to get out in the field. And especially when I very first started in CAD, man, I, I had a boss that <laughs> he'd just, you know, circle the whole page in red and hand it back to me and say, go back and figure it out. <laughs> and, uh, but, uh, you know, and then just like, this was one that I know you're big on was peer to peer. I think that's, you know, I, I haven't done a lot of that when I was coming through the industry, but, um, I think it's important and I think it's, uh, makes it a little funner. Yeah, definitely peer to peer was a big one for me because um, uh, come back to new hires, right? They had a standard operating procedure. They had w- what the knowledge was we shared. They had a checklist in front of them. And so the first person coming on, that person would quality control all the work coming through the department. So the guy who's been there for five years is getting the stuff checked <laughs> by the new guy. Um, and, you know, it kind of, it kind of like you don't want to be the new guy and tell him what he did wrong, but also there's a checklist <laughs> for a reason. That's your quality assurance, and that also helps build communication and culture, which we're going to get into those in some in some other slides here. But that's that's the important of like, okay, um, I knew I don't know what I'm talking about, but I have a list here that tells me what I'm talking about. I know that these things have to be on the list. I know what they look like because of my SOPs. So when a guy from five years hands me something, they're going to miss some things. You know, if someone says you know they know everything about Revit, you know. I, I don't know if I believe them because you know, there's so much to learn and it's impossible to remember everything. So that's why we have these SOPs and internal training and quality assurance checklists. Um, and, you know, a lot of companies, you know, yeah. they, they, uh, they don't, you know, without that, what it is, you don't break it down. And it's like, it's a, 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 a you know, a car company building cars or something where you have just the same thing every day. So you know, every project, it's a little bit different or, Oh, I forgot that. Or, just scheduling it, it, it just helps with all of this, you know, it keeps everything tight and everything moving correctly. Yeah. Um, the last one on this was just, you know, superior, superior to peer, of course, yeah. which is that's your, that's your last check before it goes out. The accountability, I want to touch back on that. The accountability to have on someone who's doing the work, especially for, for new people and people who've been there for a while is huge because you gotta, you gotta have the accountability everywhere. Right. So you have your new person check that person, that person fixes it, new person signs it off. Okay, what does it mean to go to another peer and have them check it? Do they see something else? Um, now because you're superior and they see something else. And so that's just, again, communication, talking to each other, growing confidence in what you're doing at the job you're at, which again is a big deal, when, especially when you're starting off. And so having accessible bin department starts with when you first show up and then how you follow through with that throughout the years quality assurance, accountability, SOPs. And then the next one, <laughs> uh, the next one here is um, what's your process for change? So uh, 
the process for change change is inevitable <laughs> it happens everywhere right, right. and uh it's probably the worst thing ever because no one likes it and you can't force anything on anyone and it costs money right <laughs> right so what is your process for change how do you go about implementing a change in let's say it's your standing operating procedures let's say it's a your quality assurance checklist do you just hand out a new one do you solely integrate? Do you communicate with your team? Um, all of these are are just as good as the other. It just depends on the situation and how you're doing it, right? Right. If there's yeah. a just like if there's a new rule and it says like you have to plumb this way, right? Based on the new <laughs> standard set of rules that come out, right? That's just like this is it. You have to do yeah. it, yeah. right? No matter. Right. But now there's a checklist change that's internal, and you're like, well. You know, we've been getting this right. I'm going to remove that off and I'm going to put this thing on. We've been getting wrong a lot, right? <laughs> and so that's kind of maybe a communicative thing. There's a lot of things for change, but how do you do that change? Well, you know, I I think you brought up a a, a point before that, uh, or well, I remember I was talking about this prior and uh, <laughs> one of your points was, um, you know, how, how do you, uh, 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 oh, I can't remember what you said now. We'll just move on. <laughs> <laughs> Um, another thing about the change is, you know, I like to get the team involved because I think that improves culture, right? If you have a team that's open communication, you build culture, you're making these change processes with them, telling them what's happening and why it's happening, maybe taking some input from them, uh, because they're using that stuff every day, right? They're going to be that's using it. <laughs> that was the word I was thinking of input. <laughs> on how that, that last yeah i was kind of think of, of, of how your team did with that last change you know having like something and going back and looking at failures and stuff is always good yeah especially if your team can give you that input because that again is going to build culture and then that leads us into our next slide here right um so david what's your experience with building culture um you know a lot of the places i worked <laughs> they had a culture and and you know you really adapted to theirs. So I, I can't say I've built a ton of culture at companies, right? Mm -hmm. A lot of the places I worked at kind of had their thing. They they had a what they expected of people, the groups that they wanted, the the, the people they, you know. So I, I don't have a ton of experience with that, but I imagine you do. <laughs> so, so creating culture is, I would think, by far one of the most important things with building a successful BIN department. Um, cause culture is going to generate knowledge. It's going to generate communication. It's going to generate sharing things, right? Team decisions are huge. Ultimately as a bit manager or as starting off, right. And you had the final say, but you start including your team menus. You start talking about the standard operating procedures, right? You start talking about change and they come up with a suggestion and you take the suggestion seriously and you implement that change, but you have it all in like a group session, right? And you have like an open communication. Open communication, no such thing as a stupid question. This is all about feeling comfortable in the workplace, which I know sounds a little silly, but everyone has felt that intimidation when starting off new, especially in a BIM department where you come in with zero knowledge of what they're doing there and how they do it. Um, and this is the easy intimidation. And this generates, you know, again, it generates communication, which then generates, you know, have you seen this before? Have you done this? Uh, I was in a department where uh, we were actually implementing rows of keyboard shortcuts on a keyboard button. So we we're actually doing complicated, instead of using like Dynamo script or something, they're using complicated uh, keystrokes on a single button and, and mounting it to the keyboard. I had a guy who had, you know, the 10 buttons on his mouse and he would generate sheets and do dimensions. There. He would never lift his hand and put it on a keyboard. He would just have it on his mouse, you know, like, like a macro. Exactly. Like a macro yeah. yeah. <laughs> and you start doing project tracking and then, you know, they're coming up with their own ways to run through projects, with it, whether it be Excel or a different software or within Revit or BIM 360, right? Culture generates innovation, period. If you have great culture, more people are going to want to try and do things. They're going to want to show things. I remember if there was something cool happening and I was like blowing my mind how it worked. I'm like, you need to show this guy how to do that because he's struggling all the time. And then I'll learn it too, but you got to figure well, that out. Right. Just, a, a, you know, a group interest, right? Everybody's here. Yeah. Nobody's miserable because I've been at the companies where it's uh, everybody's just miserable all the time and complaining. Mm -hmm. it, it's never fun, man. And so, just 
ran a poll. Um, Yeah, we just ran the poll. Have you implemented an internal Revit handbook with 75% of you um, saying no? And that is certainly something that can um, build towards a shared culture in your workplace. Yes, 100%. And I talk about this internal Revit handbook because I've actually had to write one before. And uh, it is immensely helpful, especially if it's something you can have on their desk that's like a piece of paper, not a PDF, but something they can always readily grab. Um, And that's usually an index of, oh, I forgot how to do this thing. Or this guy who specializes in electrical is now doing structural because the structural guy is sick. But now I can go through that and find it and stuff instead of, yeah, go ahead. Just Well, just also having like, you could just have roles and responsibilities, right? So, you know, Mm -hmm. you know, your project lead is responsible for these items. If you want to become a project lead, that's what the training you need to, to get. That's why you need to improve yourself. And, you know, and it yeah. just gives people, it gives people the side at the end of the road. Cause sometimes it's hard to know, to know what you don't know. Right. <laughs> I used to, I used to have people um, tell me what they wanted to learn. And so I'd put their project on what they wanted to learn. And I said, what's the thing you hate mostly. And then that was their next project duty. But usually I had opposites. So the electrical guy and the plumbing guy, right. I had two specialists. <laughs> And they hated each other's disciplines. And so I swapped him for a project. I said, you're going to do this one project, but you're going to talk to him about everything you need. And you're going to talk to him about everything you need. Right. And believe it or not, they actually started working together on stuff where now they were coordinating as they're building because that guy had plumbing experience and within the model understands what has to be done. And the electrical guy, same thing. Right. Yeah, so yeah. you can have specialists, but be well-rounded enough to where like this guy's sick or, they're not coming to work tomorrow or today or the next week and a half or they're on vacation. How do you cover that? Right. Um, I think well-rounded is always good. Specialized is always good. Um, usually have a specialist with some other skills that can help out with. Right. I, I think most companies prefer the well-rounded so they could, you know, <laughs> yeah. but you also need your specialist. So well, you hire a specialist and try and round them out. Right. <laughs> All right. <laughs> so yeah, I mean, it, you know, and that kind of feeds in, what you were saying was the communication, right? Mm-hmm. Just making it, making it everybody uh, comfortable. And I really like what you're saying about just like keeping things like passionate, right? Keeping everybody like interested in learning, not one, not coming to work and just miserable and uh, right. allowing that conversation to happen. But, you know, more than that, it's more of like, you know, where is all your information being stored? You know, mm-hmm. uh, allowing for a, well, Un- unconfrontational conversation right you know you don't it's a lot of times in this industry everywhere everybody hates each other by the end of a job nobody <laughs> likes the other you know you start out liking each other and then by the end of the job you just don't want to ever see them again until the next one of course right. and then <laughs> and so th- th- that's that's a great thing like unconfrontational com- communication also includes like do I want to bother my boss and ask this question today? Do I want to bother those guys? Make make the the space like I can ask these questions, right? I again, no such thing as stupid questions. Building culture. If I'm allowed to communicate openly with my in my head and how I think things are going, right? Obviously, some people take that and then they get a really big head about it. But you know, if you're a human being about it, you kind of take that. You go through the conversation. You're like, oh, um, this is the one. I done it this way before my last job, right? Mm-hmm. You guys, oh, well, we do it this way here. Uh, I know, yeah. So, well, <laughs> why did you I'm guys do it your last <laughs> job one way? Why do you do it here this way, right? And have the conversation. Not even don't try and like force it down people's throats, right? Yeah, uh, because I remember changing up entirely the whole workflow of the entire BIM department a year and a half into me building the workflow because. I learned something new that I can eliminate a whole bunch of stuff. So I had to rewrite all the SOPs and then go through that. But that ultimately helped my team have to do less work to get the job done efficiently. And so they wanted to put more time into innovating and understanding SOPs. And then how can I do even, (laughs) sounds bad. How can I do even less work, but still do the work efficiently and get the job done, right? (laughs) Everyone talks about level of detail. What level of detail do I need to actually complete the job, right? Um, And that's kind of what it was. And communication allowed that because people were talking. We had open communications about that stuff. Um, Communicating file sharing. File sharing is a big one too, right? So if you're like, I have this document that I found online. What do you want to look at? What is your, what's your chosen choice of platforms are out there? (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. 
Is Pro it print? Core. Is it a Xerox? Is it a yeah. uh, uh, mail? Just everything, <laughs> right? Every right. all the platforms that exist now. It's it's just like a uh, what is that called? Like a, a an oversaturation of the market. It's the same thing mm-hmm. with like you know productivity tools. Like yeah. spending all this time, time making them, but you know, <laughs> I don't know. And then it, sorry, and then chat options, right? Face to face, how you're going to deliver information. You know, talking to each other. Like I was a big part of a. Uh, when I first started, and that's a good kind of position of like learning to uh, communicate, you know, having to talk, go from the field, bring the information back, talk to the CAD department. And I mean, it, it did. It taught me, you know, what information I needed to know I'm from a job site, right, that I might not have known before. So I'm just getting, you know, I mean, yeah. <laughs> things that I'm, they're like, well, have you, uh, they'll just give you information. So you just kind of, it's kind of like a learning experience. And it's a good type of a position to have in a company is, is some sort of, uh, you know, like field field operative right <laughs> so marina put another poll up if you guys see this what would you say your team has a good flow of communication um and we got some results here awesome so we got a few here uh we could be doing better have great communication uh i have too many notifications on different platforms and that's that's exactly what we're kind of talking about um and dead silent i, I would say like the first thing you could do to start doing better or, or stop being silent is foster that communication i i once rearranged the room where i had the desks face each other instead of a wall um now their computers were in the way they weren't looking at each other's faces all the time but it also was like i make an office reference you get the jim dwight thing right so they hated each other's guts but they communicated clearly all the time they were always talking to each other um and so even if you don't like the guy you're sitting across, you're going to have some questions for him. He's going to have questions right. for you because you're working on the same drawings and it's easier to do this than to do this, you know, and it, it's simple things like that to help with communication. Also the too many notifications, um, how many platforms are you reusing to communicate in? Right. Um, are you, reusing- like every- mm-hmm. go ahead. Well, I was saying, it just seems like every suite you buy has its own communication software. So you just yeah. got to, you know, standardize it, keep it in one place, make right. sure it's not, Floating everywhere, or certain communication is only in a certain place, right? OneNote, Teams, Zoom, Google Meet, uh, Slack. Uh, there's all these other things with CRM <laughs> comes like HubSpot. <laughs> just, so, like, just how do one. you communicate <laughs> what information and in what platform, or do you chop down your platforms and say this is the only line of communication, right? So within Teams, you have. Microsoft Teams, you can put together per project and communicate on project stuff there. And you can have just open chats with people. Um, on Google Meet, that's just a video conference call you can have. Slack is a whole separate thing. Bring your notifications down to a single place. <laughs> and then maybe it'll be easier to dial them back a little bit. Um, but communication is absolutely key. And that's not only for peer-to-peer. Um, it's software-to-software software as well. So that kind of leads us into our next one. <laughs> is uh whoops i'm off one it's not in this slide it's called creating culture um i don't know why it's not showing up here but in create or not creating culture it's called uh <laughs> software fragmentation fragmentation yeah yeah so in software fragmentation we're talking about multiple platforms not communicating to each other so i have emails that get emails that get emailed because i notified by the first email right um, how do I have just an email notification on the one thing I want, right? I have <laughs> Gmail and Outlook looking out, but I made mean, Gmail is logged in in one and my Outlook's logged in the other. And I get two notifications for one email. Oh, so yeah, that's terrible, man. <laughs> uh, and that, I mean, that's just email. Let's talk about platform communication from like Revit to third party BIM 360 or, uh, in your, um, coordination software down to a machine uh-huh. back to like what does that communication look like is it all the, sorry uh-huh. i was just saying like all the, the the uh estimating and and cost things out there man this none of them communicate you know you got tremble this but then you're using fabrication parts this and then you're and it's like it's it's such a pain you know and cost estimation is a great great thing you just mentioned too right i mean Technically, you can do all those things within Revit. You can put a cost to your objects, but how do you update your objects? You got to open Revit. You got to know how to use it. So this third party develops. And so you use this third party to develop costs based on your Revit model, but it doesn't talk to exactly all the parts and pieces you need. So you got to add some manual inputs. And then right. how are you billing per hourly? And how is that billing associated with the time you're on the computer? And when you clock in, and if you open Revit, and what? And so it's 
it's a hard process that like will forever be battling, but making sure that your department, the one you're building, you're using platforms that exist and coincide with each other. Right. So right, right. hypothetical, I'm using Microsoft teams for video chat, but I'm using Slack for chat chat. Right. That doesn't make any sense to me. Right. I'd rather <laughs> have it all in one thing. And that's right, like the right. most simplest form that I think everyone kind of understands. But when you're talking software, you're talking, um, IFCs. IFCs is a perfect example, right? Yeah, IFCs yeah. are the global, right? 3D model that you can transfer between projects to projects, but I, how many people <laughs> have had issues right. going from one project to the other or missing information, right? How does that communicate? How do you fill that in the missing information in? There's a lot of things within software and our operability that can affect your just your BIM department infrastructure. Like, how are you processing your, your model? Right. And it's kind of a good point of like, company to companies are you, are you making sure that you're you're working with because you got people submitting dwgs and you know, mm -hmm. building jobs off of cad it's like sooner or later we're gonna have to <laughs> you know I, autodesk probably won't ever make the decision and, and go one way with it but as an industry we need to, to go towards you know like just a certain path the yeah. right path <laughs> yeah uh the other thing with the software fragmentation is like have a clear process to get your team visibility, right? So how does my team know where to find everything? How does my team know where to look for things, right? This kind of goes all the way back to SOPs and file location for a little bit too, but how do I make sure that my plumbing guys in this place or my electrical guys in this place understand where everyone's at and how things are communicated? And then how can I also make that visible to my contributors, the subs or GCs, right? How do I make all that visible? Do I use Navis exports? <laughs> do I do I just go into Revit and I publish the model? Do I publish the model regularly every other day? Uh, are things turned on and off? And I'm talking just strictly Revit here, but there's so many other things that talk about visibility. I think David, you you mentioned that a little bit. You want to talk about that? On the uh, uh, I'm sorry, which uh, which slide are it's, you on? It's like <laughs> having clear process to get okay. your team visibility and like yeah, getting your yeah. team updates as yeah. they happen, that kind of stuff. Uh, yeah, I guess I'm just saying uh, uh, for, for visibility. Uh, okay, I know what you're saying because I'm thinking Revit in my head. Like, what is he talking about yeah, visibility? <laughs> but yeah, just having like a clear uh, a clear path of communication. You know, I I think especially like you know you, I'm pretty new to BIMTM. Just having a, a making sure that there's there's things that are accessible to, to everybody around, right? Uh, making sure it's easy to find and it's in the same type of structures that. All, like all around where you're not going from like BIM 360 and you got things named different to, you know, SharePoint that are, they're named this and they're, you know what I mean? Things like that throw people off because they're looking for this number at the very beginning of the <laughs> the thing and it's different or something like that. It just throws you off. Just simple things like that, that making sure everything's universally uh, the same. And then also you, you don't have like 500 different groups that somebody has to join before they get all the information or things exactly. like that, you know, uh, yeah. Uh, but you know, like I, I know, like we're we're big on teams. And yeah, I think teams is great, man. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So the next thing that I think is like the most, not one of the most important, but very good to follow up on once you're like kind of starting to set up your department is future improvements. Mm -hmm. So collecting data as things are happening. We talk about checklist change, right? Checklist change. Things need to change because I've seen already that they understand this concept and they're no longer having an issue with it. But now they're having an issue with this concept, so that's going on the checklist. Um, I know the specialized people in my room. I know how fast they take the model. I know what they're capable of doing, right? Collecting the data of how long it takes to do things is going to help you with your estimations. Uh, it's going to make you choose um, who to put on what project for what their needs are because you know what data you have on that person's specializes and the needs of the project. So understanding individual strengths and weaknesses, common project issues, adding or removing checklist items, better estimation of time. Um, these are all things that can be done future improvements wise, right? You're building, I talked about changing the whole entire workflow a year and a half into it, right? Because it's crazy. It, it's just, <laughs> my data was this. And then now this thing I learned changes my data to this. And now I can just really start cranking out. Right. I mean, yeah, I mean, you have a great environment to do that in too, man, like, because it's so controlled. But yeah, I mean, it, it is, it's definitely, a, it's bold. 
yeah, getting getting future improvements and data on your BIM team is going to be huge for you to grow as a BIM department. Um, even even if uh, you bring in like um, PMs and cost estimators and stuff, right? What does the PM need? What is that data that he needs always? Okay, how can you put that into your model as he needs it? Or how can you put the estimation data in that he needs it? Maybe it's not cost, but maybe it's count. So maybe you have a schedule that's getting built out already. And I, I keep talking strictly Revit because that's what we're all here for right now. Uh, when you're in, doing a BIM department, BIM is not Revit, but Revit is like a tool that is used widely. Um, right. But how do I improve the data that is getting sent out to the floor? What is getting sent out to the floor? Do they need everything getting sent out? You know, like I oftentimes had many uh, communications with the field guys of, hey, so what on this print do you actually use, right? And it's, right. it's like, well, we mostly just look at this. I don't know why you do that. I was like, well, why didn't you tell me? Because then I could just remove that from my process and you can get it sooner and faster and better, you know? Right. Um, and that goes future improvements, communication, it all goes down. So like as a summary, you can look at it as a whole. BIM departments are built off communication, culture, and SOPs, right? And how you distribute those SOPs, how you build that culture, and how you communicate is how successful your BIM department's going to be. Yeah. Uh, here's another uh, poll that just showed up. How effective is your current documentation process? Um, it's okay. Great. We're satisfied with it. The best there's ever been. Need some improvement. You know, this is how do you, I wonder what the results are here. Awesome. Okay. So we definitely can use improvement on documentation, documentation processes. Um, and one way that I've handled this is like little bullet points on a OneNote when I'm going through it, if I have to build a process for it. Uh, okay. And I'm line and then dimension and then, okay. And then I'll build on upon that later. Right. And then I'm starting to build out an actually worded document of that process. Yeah, no, I, I think that's, that's huge. You know, the documentation, I, I mean, it's really what we do, no matter what we're doing. If, if you're working in a BIM department, you're documenting a building, you're documenting mm -hmm. installation of a building, everything you do is a documentation, right? <laughs> of something. And, and just being able to, to have clear, concise uh, documentation inside of companies, it's, I mean, it's the most valuable skill I've learned. <laughs> and, 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 you know, the biggest thing for me is, is what I realize is what I'll do is I'll start documentation and then I'll just get so busy with this or that, that you don't put the effort and time in like making sure you go back, and clean it and then make it look good. You know, so you got to allow your employees that time of, of, uh, you know, and just even updating it, making sure and running through it with somebody, making sure that what you have is accurate to the process. You're not just like, you know what I mean? <laughs> yeah. I mean, All that's that it. You just brought up a good time of making time. Um, with the infrastructure, you got to make time for it. You can't, you can't just like Google and SO, put it in chat GTP, right? I'm sure it works great, but you can't just hand it out and expect it to work. You got to take your time. You got to put into it. And so you're not going to do all this stuff right off the bat, right? You're probably the first thing I would suggest doing is doing your documentation, building your SOPs. So if you don't have that currently in your department at all right now, as it sits, I have all your leads. Hey, can you go through this project and just document? I just want you to go like, what was the process to build this sheet? What do you need on this sheet? What's build the checklist. It's easier to start with the checklist and then be like, okay, based on this checklist, this is the process to build from. Right. Um, right. And so you smart, small and grow, uh, grow large and put more detail in it later, but definitely having that is going to be huge. Um, and that, that kind of sums up the basic infrastructure. I mean, there's a whole lot more we can talk on. Um, but I do want to leave some time for some questions. Uh, Marina, we got any questions here? Yeah, we do. Let me pull that up real quick. And for everyone else, now is the time to use that Q&A tool. <clears throat> Excuse me. Awesome. So we had one person ask, is your BIM execution plan part of your SOP? That's a great question. Yeah, so it can be. Um, it makes sense that it would. Your BIM execution plan has obviously everything you need for when you're bidding on a project or, you know, even going through a project as far as what your process is. Um, you can actually expand on that BIMX plan and start saying, okay, well, for this portion of the project, this BIMX plan, section one or section two, this is how we go through and actually do that in our office, right? That's building an SOP. Um, for this section, I can go into detail and say, this is how we're doing that in our process. You know, so we got a lot, we got a lot of, um, you got a lot of things to pull from your BIMX plan. I think that's a, right. that's Just a great piece. Of that. 
Yeah. Like on, on what you do, right? Mm hmm. Yep. You're going to be different. Like what's for you, what's for if you're working for a GC on that BIM execution plan, what's for the GC and what's going to be your requirements? You know, those right. are different checklists, you know. Right. Yeah. Uh, I, you guys, go ahead. Oh, no, please continue. Uh, if you guys have any further questions, uh, we're more than happy. We got some time left here. Um, especially when it comes to building a department or improving a department. If you guys have any, you know, kind of issues we talked about today, uh, more than happy to help try and sort them out. I've got a question for you. So 75% of our audience said they don't have an internal Revit handbook. What would you say are kind of the key considerations they should keep in mind if they're going to go and develop one? I would say first things first is when you hire a new person, what do you tell them what to do? Right. And that's the beginning of your handbook. Guy comes in. Okay. What do I have to do? Well, you're going to take this and you're going to sit here and you're going to do this thing. Okay. How do I do that thing? You're going to do this, 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 right. And you're, you're talking, you've, you've done your handbook before. You just have never written it down, right? Having it documented, documenting your process. Like we just talked about having it documented is going to be huge for your department to grow and have that reference to always sit by. So, Everyone, when you get a new hire, you, you kind of go over the same spiel, but slightly worded differently and people pick up on different things. And then over time, people have habits that they build, right? Well, you can build those habits for them for what you're doing in your department by having it written. And you can say, you can have your habits, but these are the habits you're going to use, right? Um, so I would say, helps. go ahead, David. I would say it also helps with accountability, just leading back to that. You know, like mm -hmm. this, it's written here, you know, you have this, you have your SOP, you have no reason not to, to, to follow through with it. Right. Right. So, you know, you gotta take accountability for, for the, the mistakes. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Accountability is big. We talked about that. That's yeah. great. Thanks. Another one for you guys. How do you deal with the BIM guys that don't want to communicate or be a part of the culture? That is a very good question. Um, it depends. You got to find out the motivation. Right. Are they there? Do they want to learn? Help them learn, you know, hey, uh, we're going to try and get you on this track. We're going to do this or, hey, I want you to kind of help run this project associately or kind of work with this guy on this project. Right. Um, like I said, I I turned desks to face each other. Now, that wasn't to force each other to communicate, but it opened the door for communication. Right. Um, a lot of times having a meeting with everyone involved helps build that culture and you know, every Monday morning, everyone gets together. How was your weekend? What'd you do? Awesome. And you go through every person, you may, you may, making that person talk. A lot of times it's not so much that they don't want to be a part of the culture. It's they want to have a valid input. So allow their inputs to be valid. Allow them to have confidence when they speak and what they're talking about. Or, you know, there are people that went from CAD to Revit and hate the fact that they're doing Revit and they're doing CAD now. And so <laughs> take some of their input. You know, a lot of People say CAD's not Revit, Revit's not CAD, and that's very true. But there are some things that you've learned from CAD that you can implement in Revit that may make sense, right? Um, so ask for input. Allow them to communicate and build that culture with you rather than kind of like, I want you to do this with us right now. You know, like let them come to you kind of thing. That's a great question. That's a great question. You've got one more. Our company just started getting into BIM. Hey, that's great. <laughs> I that's awesome. am the front runner on it. I am the only one for now. So we don't have any BIM management. I want to start it for my company. How do I get started? Awesome. Uh, well, you have already gotten started because you're doing it. Right. Um, you're learning. I would it. say start. Um I, I guess I, it depends on the company you're in, what that process is. Um, but reach out, communicate to people. There's a huge community out there of like maybe your industry you're in, right? If you're in uh, plumbing, hey, I'm doing my plumbing department. Some things you need to have is are you going to use families or ITMs? How do you model with them? Um, if you're not understanding anything within the software you're using, first get training on it because it'll help you understand what that process looks like. Um, especially if you are the only one right now, you know, um, you already got buy-in from higher up to say we're doing BIM. Okay. Well, if we're doing BIM, I got to have the education to understand how I'm going to do it, get the proper training, 
and then start building up on it. And, and I talked to your project manager. See what parts of jobs that you could start picking up that will save the most money. Where where are the guys in the field taking the longest? Where you know what's happening? Like get get an idea of what's going on in the company and and what problems you can solve, and then get the training to do it. You know, what one hundred percent. You got to take it in bites too. You can't just take it all as a whole. Like um, when I was implementing BIM from CAD, we would just do. Um, I was in modular, right? We would just do certain wall sections. And then we did whole wall sections. And then we did floor and ceiling and wall sections because they're basically the same drawing. And then, okay, we're going to start doing some MEPs and implementing. So it's going to take time. It's not going to happen overnight. Um, but understanding the software and then going through that, that's going to be probably your, your biggest um, hurdle. And then going through and building your process after that. All right. Excellent. Great. Thank you so much, David and Alex, for this presentation today. And thank you to our wonderful audience for attending. I hope that you found the information valuable. Make sure to follow Evolve and BIMTM on all the social media channels for more content to help you develop your BIM process. Uh, you can also find more demos and past webinars on the Evolve YouTube channel. And as a reminder, this webinar has been recorded and we will send out the recording in an email to all registrants. And uh, thank you again, everyone. Have a fantastic day. All right. Thanks. Bye.